1931, Nicholas Guyon wrote, The African injection in Cuba is so profound and in our well-irrigated social hydrography, so many bloodlines crisscross that one would have to be a miniaturist to unravel that hieroglyph. Guyen's poetry is rooted in cross-cultural imagination of the Caribbean, and nowhere is this more true than in The Ballad of Two Grandfathers, a poem from West Indies Limited, published in 1934. The poem is dedicated, as is the volume of poems, to raising the level of consciousness regarding Cuba's African heritage, the fleeting tender dark shadow of the African grandfather who put an indelible curl into your yellow hair, as Guyan has written. Born in 1902, Guyan is one of the greatest poets of the Hispanic world. Cuba's national poet and president of the National Union of Cuban Writers and Artists since 1961, Guyan is identified with the ideological movement that paved the way for the Cuban Revolution in 1959. As might be imagined then, his poetry is infused by a keen sense of history. What was this history? To give you a better sense of the nature between the Caribbean native and the sailors of Columbus' second voyage, here is a letter from one of Columbus's officers. He writes, While I was in the boat, I captured a very beautiful Carib woman, who the said Lord Admiral Columbus gave to me, and with whom, having taken her into my cabin, she being naked according to their custom, I conceived desire to take pleasure. I wanted to put my desire into execution, but she did not want it and treated me with her fingernails in such a manner that I wished I had never begun. But seeing that, to tell you the end of it all, I took a rope and thrashed to well for which she raised such unheard of screams that you would not have believed your ears. The ways that cultures collide and the way that literature is influenced by such collisions is often referred to as post-colonial studies. This kind of study focuses on national and regional legacies of colonialism, the dominance and occupation of certain nations and regions of the world by others. The Ballad of Two Grandfathers, published in 1934, is the poet's attempt to make meaning of the cultural heritage of the West Indies, a term synonymous with the Caribbean. The poet writes, Shadows of which only I see, I'm watched by my two grandfathers. A bone point lance, a drum of hide in wood of my black grandfather, a ruff on a broad neck, a warrior's gray armament, my white grandfather. The poet goes on to write, so many ships, so many ships, so many blacks, so many blacks, so much resplendent cane, how harsh the traitor's whip, a rock of tears and blood, of veins and eyes half open, of empty dawns and plantation sunsets, and a great voice, a strong voice, splitting the silence, so many ships, so many ships, so many blacks. How to, how to, how to resolve the tension between the two races, between the two worlds, you imagines two grandfathers embracing, and here is the poem's conclusion. They embrace, they sigh, they raise their sturdy heads, both of equal size beneath the high stars, both of equal size, a black longing, a white longing, both of equal size. They scream, dream, weep, sing, they dream, weep, sing, they weep, sing, sing. In the end, for Gillian, there is pain, but there's also reconciliation. The reconciliation comes from evoking the history by facing it, by seeing meaning in the conflict. Derek Walcott, born in St. Lucia, is, the, is another West Indies artist who faces the same dilemma. In one of his poems, A Far Cry from Africa, he wrote what is perhaps his most famous line, The gorilla wrestles with the superman, I who am poisoned with the blood of both. Where shall I turn, divided to the vein? Born in 1930, Walcott has devoted his talent for some 40 years to answering this question. As a poet and playwright, he investigates the cultural matrix of the new world. Let's take a look how it is accomplished in a rather well-known poem of Walcott's, The Spoiler's Return. To begin to understand this poem, we have to know something about the Calypso tradition. Uh, rooted in the slave experience, the Calypso performer was one who, through song, provided social critique and thus served a post-colonial function in the Afro-Caribbean community.
In this poem, Walcott summons the spirit of the famous Calypso performer in Trinidad, the great spoiler, during the 1940s and 1950s. The poet takes on the persona of the spoiler and renders a view of post-colonial society in the Caribbean. The poet writes that Satan has, Satan has sent him back to check out this town. In his view, the shark racing the shadow of the shark across clear coral rocks does make them dark. This is my premonition of the scene of what is passing over the Caribbean. Perhaps more so than Goyon, Walcott is deeply influenced by the Western tradition in literature. In 1970, Walcott wrote that all the writers of his generation were natural assimilators. We know the literature is of empires, Greek, Roman, British, through their essential classics. This influence is explicit in The Spoiler's Return when the poet calls up the old brigade of satire, says, back me up, Marshal, Juvenile, and Pope. To hang their self, I give plenty of rope. Join, spoilers, chorus. Sing the song with me. Lord Rochester, who passed the nimble flea. So the European tradition is clearly evident in the satire. As we might expect also of Caribbean writers, the subject is political. Walcott writes, all those who promise free and just debate then blow up radicals to save the state who allow, in democracy's defense, a parliament with spiked heads on offense. And you can really hear the European satiric tradition there of Marshal Juvenal Pope and, again, of the Restoration writer Rochester. As the poet sees it, is carnival, straight carnival, that's all. At the end of the poem, the spoiler returns to the grave, having given a vision that is biting and dark, while the actual active colonial oppression is absent, the freedom and independence that are in these, in, in these societies are just illusion. Censorship and chaos remain. In Walcott, we see the significance that poetry holds for the Caribbean writer and his culture. In another poem, Forests of Europe, Walcott writes, what's poetry if it's worth its salt? But a phrase men can pass from hand to mouth, from hand to mouth across the centuries, the bread that lasts when systems have decayed. For Walcott, poetry is a valid way of addressing the complex issues of Western civilization as these issues manifest themselves in the new world. The power of literature to address social issues is in fact a virtue associated with a third of our authors, V.S. Naipaul. You've just heard of him in Spoiler's Return. I see these islands and I feel to ball area of darkness with V.S. Nightfall. Uh, such are the bleak pronouncements of the citizen of the world as Walcott recognizes V.H. Naipaul called in Spoiler's Return to V.S. Nightfall. East Indian by descent, Naipaul was born and grew up in Trinidad. At 18, he immigrated to England and attended Oxford University. He worked as a radio broadcaster and book reviewer. He traveled in England, the Caribbean, Latin America, India, Africa, and the United States, developing a global consciousness Often he's thought of as a spokesman or as an interpreter of the third world of developing nations. In his short story, The Pyrotechnicist, Nepal portrays the world in which he once lived. The story was published in the collection Miguel Street in 1959. The setting for the story is Port of Spain in Trinidad. Nepal writes, A stranger could drive through Miguel Street and just say slum because he could see no more. But we who live there saw our street as world, where everybody was quite different from everybody else. In this world, a man named Morgan was a comedian. Yet, Nepal looks more deeply at this character, Morgan, and realizes that with his love for fireworks, Morgan was the first artist Nepal had ever met. His fireworks were manifestations of Morgan's search for beauty. Yet in colonial society, this search is thwarted. Morgan is considered a fool. He decides to punish his children as a joke, prescribing strokes, the British system, beating, as a result of infractions such as talking to other children in the street. Morgan comes to his children and announces the punishment, but the joke misfires completely. The joke becomes, as Naipaul writes, terrible and frightening. Unable to achieve anything even remotely resembling an authentic, meaningful life, Morgan eventually burns his own house, but in the fire, the fireworks explode. Naipaul writes, what really made the fire beautiful was Morgan's fireworks going off. Then, for the first time, everybody saw the astonishing splendor of Morgan's fireworks. People who used to scoff at Morgan felt a little silly. I have traveled in many countries since, but I have seen nothing to beat the fireworks show 
in Morgan's house that night. Morgan was charged with arson, but he got off. Some say, no, Paul writes, Morgan went to Venezuela. They say he went mad. They say he became a jockey in Colombia. They say all sorts of things. But the people of Miguel Street were always romancers. And so it is that Nepal presents a complete picture of a society that might have otherwise been stereotyped and thus overlooked or oversimplified. The energy of Morgan reveals the energy of those who strive for recognition in the face of social oppression, the end result of colonialism. The pyrotechnicist is an early story. In many ways, Nepal presents accounts of a society in which he grew up, yet he's simply kind of an ironist here. The tragic aspect of these stories are not really examined, nor is the reader intensely involved in the plight of his characters. However, in later works, such as A, Horse, a House for Mr. Beeswas, 1961, In a Free State, 1971, Gorillas, 1975, and A Bend in the River, 1979, Nepal matures. As John Updike wrote of Nepal's later work, Nepal is incomparably situated and equipped to bring us news of one of the contemporary world's great subjects the mingling of its peoples. What are we then to make of these writers? First, we should realize that they help us to, carry, to, help us to question categories such as civilization or foreignness. These writers help us to understand the complex consequences of American and European domination in other societies. Second, these writers lead us to understand that literature plays an important part in cultural consciousness and in social reform. In the United States, literature is often seen as incidental to culture, a tertiary element, perhaps not an element at all in life, yet for Caribbean writers, literature is vibrant, meaningful form, and it's often a critique. And finally, these writers should help us think and think again about the idea of possession, about the idea of ownership. Who owns what, and what can actually be owned, is expressed wonderfully in Nicol Guyon's poem, Can You? I'll end this lecture with the beginning of that poem. He writes, Can you sell me the air that passes through your fingers and hits your face and undoes your hair? Maybe you could sell me five dollars worth of wind or more, perhaps, sell me a cyclone. Maybe you would sell me the thin air, the air, not all of it, that sweeps into your garden blossom on blossoms into your garden for the birds. Ten dollars of pure air? The air, it turns and passes with butterfly-like spins. No one owns it. No one.